Hey, this is Jared Krause, host of the Buying Online Businesses podcast, and this is episode number 12. And in this episode, I talk with Mr. Charlie Valher from Outsourcing Angels, who's bought many online businesses, runs many online businesses, and has a whole lot of knowledge in the online business space. And in this episode, we talk about like what not to do after you bought your first online business. And there's so many mistakes that people go away and make, especially when they buy their first online business and keep continue to, continuing to make those as they move forward and buy more businesses to build a bigger portfolio. Talking about things that can allow us to get really emotional about our investment and get excited and cause us to do some crazy things that can be destructive in our growth towards our business and our profits and ourselves even. So, if you guys want to know about how to go away and buy online businesses and not be self-destructive, you certainly need to listen to this episode. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Buying Online Businesses podcast. And today I have with me again, Mr. Charlie Valher from Outsourcing Angels. And we're going to be talking about a really cool topic today that some people may not have actually thought of when they're first buying their first online business and that's what not to do after buying your first online business because we can go away and make so many mistakes and we want to eliminate that from happening. So Charlie, I want to ask you, is there some, some things that you see that people have done or something that you've done when it's come to, when you first bought your business and you've gone away and been super excited and pumped like I have? You know, which is a bad thing to do is getting emotional about the investment uh, and gone down a track that may not be the most necessary track at the time of first owning it. Oh, definitely. And I think you just highlighted um, something so important. It's near impossible not to be excited and emotional after you've just bought a business, especially your first one. I'm going to say you've got zero chance. (laughs) <laughs> it really is and I see that with my clients is super pumped they're really excited and it's it's great and they come away and ask all these you know all these questions I want to do this and that and this and that I'm like cool let's just let's just get our feet back on the ground here and uh, really think about this so yeah that is a good point I, I just we can chat about that further yeah well it's interesting and I'll, I'll take you back my first business so my very first thing I did online was um, eBay I was selling goods on eBay and something that just I'll never, ever forget was like the endless energy I had for that business, right? So it's like, you know, that emotional kick came in. I'd bought it, super excited. I'd be on there doing things and then I'd look at the clock and then I was like, holy shit, it's two in the morning. <laughs> like there's this rush that comes with it. And like, I think anyone who started a business or bought a business is like, it's important. It's impossible not to have that effect in some nature. But I think um, this also leads into like my first point is this, oh, I don't even know what to call it, experience often leads to some really, really silly mistakes because that emotion kind of carries in and that excitement carries in. And as emotion kind of lifts, so does the uh, quality of our decision making kind of goes down, kind of goes the opposite direction. Yeah. So I think like the first thing I'll kind of highlight is like the number one thing you really have to be aware of is your emotional state. Like the biggest mistake you can make in the first thing, or you know, what not to do is to get really emotional in that first part and then just do everything, very little thinking, just kind of, all excited, trying anything and really not being methodical or logical. I think that's a really big danger. I love that. And that wasn't something that I was thinking about talking about at all. And I'm glad it came in straight into the podcast straight away. And I know that when I bought my first business as well, and uh, I bought it, uh, I bought it off Flipper actually. And I was so excited, like I was like, okay, awesome, and I made some quick sales. Well, the business had already made some money before I had actually had the the full transfer of the business, so there was money sitting in the PayPal account, and the and the previous owner was like, mate, that's your that's your money, that's you know, you technically own the business as of this date. This is your money, and I'm you know, this is like the big, the most groundbreaking event for me, especially at the point where I was trying to make money online previously from my travel blog, making a little bit of money, but this was far more significant. And 
it was a massive rush and I was like, that's awesome. I'm going to make all this money. And I did end up spending way too much time on the business and it was ineffective time, Charlie. And that was because I was, I was on a rush and I was spending that energy on things that didn't really matter rather than conserving it and then taking a step back, getting grounded and having a more, like you said, methodical approach. It's nostalgic, isn't it? Looking back on these first businesses and just the excitement and just, you know, take a moment to enjoy it when you do have this guys. It is a fun time, but definitely at your peril, as Jared's saying here, be careful of those emotions. Yeah. And even, even I enjoy it now. Like I've, I've got a smile on my face of like, wow, that was a, a massive pinnacle for me. And I think it's just the, the key thing is that yes, those emotions is something to be aware of, but what, is caused from having those emotions and that's just like you said it's it's being reactive and, and doing way too many things and that can just be destructive so is there anything like when you're running your ebay business like what were some things that you would suggest people that you had had done that you perceive that wouldn't be the best for people to do when they're buying their first business oh i'll give you an example okay so um much like you, I had this effect of like, you know, uh, on eBay, I don't know if it still does this, but it used to does do this, is you had an app on your phone and when you made a, um, a sale, um, it actually made a sound like a cash register. So like if you made a sale, it would go, cha-ching. Um, <laughs> clever move by eBay. Very good. Uh, oh, and so intoxicating. So what happened for me is that in this first business, um, you know, Things started to sell and that sound was like proof of concept that, you know, it was real. There was money. It was, it was, it had happened. Like it wasn't some dream. Like this was actually a business. And the mistake I made is like I had a product or one particular product. I won't name it on here, um, but I had one particular product that was doing super well. And instead of like doubling down on trying to sell more of that product, what I actually did, and I look back on this and think, you idiot is I spent a lot of time researching other products instead of working on the product that was actually selling. Like I could have sold a lot more of this by focusing on making my listing better or negotiating better terms on the product I was buying to get it for a better price or looking at ways to ship it more effectively or making bundles or things to sell with it. Instead, I was like, you know, spending hours and hours doing all this research, looking for like, you know, products in different spheres and trying to, you know, I think it seemed logical to me at the time. It seemed like it was a good idea because I was selling one thing, I could sell more things, yeah. but lost endless hours of research on things that just weren't important and ultimately led to no profit or growth in the business. You know what, Charlie, that's totally normal. And that's something that most people actually do is they and that's what I thought of you know that's why I went and bought more businesses because I thought the more businesses I own the more money I'm going to make and the same with the more products I get on my store the more money I'm going to make and I see this when people buy it and I know that my clients are like let's get all these other you know products on and all that sort of stuff and it's so much time spent when you don't even know if those products are going to sell anyway and whereas you could prioritize like you, like you say, is the profit of making more money from selling or pushing more traffic to the best selling products and cutting costs of shipping and, you know, making things far more slimline. It's just so normal to have that thought process of like, well, if I've got three products that are doing really well, I just need to get another 60 of those products on my site and I'm going to be a billionaire which is not the case. You could also even take off those, take off the two worst products and just have one product and just push everything towards that instead and get really, really niched. Definitely, definitely. It's the same thing that happened for me on my first business is that I, very similar to you, is that I was like, all right, I need to go away and I need to make a whole lot more content and get my name out there and spread absolutely everything. Whereas... All I really needed to do was I had just a couple of products. I just needed to get make sure I could get more traffic 
to that actual product and that landing page and just really push that and spend more time and energy just on that one web page rather than trying to produce three web pages per or three blog posts per week which is what I was doing you know I was I actually hired a content writer and I was content writing myself with this keyword research and SEO and all this sort of stuff when I could have made far more money in that first business and this is obviously because I've learned a lot through that time span of me owning my first business to where I'm at now but I mean that's what you guys are listening to this podcast for is is to learn from our mistakes and learn from what we've done and what works for us is that focus on what's really working rather than trying to make a, a million different other decisions to make more money that may not actually work at all. Definitely. Definitely agree with that, Jared. Mm. So what I mean by start doubling down on on those things, Charlie, is that I needed to really double down on getting more people to that landing page. And I think for you, it was you needed to double down on that particular product that was better. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. It was, um, again, caught in that emotional train of thinking that was the way, but it definitely wasn't in this case. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's kind of like when somebody buys their first business, that emotion comes in and we're like, oh, this is awesome and it's really exciting. And they they just want to do all that, all these different things when there's just this, like there's these signs in front of them, which is, which is the low hanging fruit. And with that low hanging fruit, it's better to just tackle that low hanging fruit essentially and squeeze and, you know, generate as much income out of the business straight away. So you can get a higher return on your investment rather than just look at the whole long-term thing and tackle all these bigger things and try and get those working which it actually takes a lot more time to do that. Don't, don't you agree? I definitely agree. And this is something I've played with more and more, to be honest. <clears throat> so in recent times, when I do my due diligence, I make a list of like, if I bought this business, what would I do? And I make three little lists is like low hanging fruit, medium hanging fruit, and then really hard fruit, which it kind of looks funny when you title them as that. But it kind of um, <laughs> it, it, it kind of makes sense uh, a little bit from there. And you know, previously I didn't do that. I would just make this list of things I could do without any emphasis on like how much effort would be put into actually getting them done. And when I've looked at businesses, sometimes some of the hard hanging fruit might be projects that take three or four months. So it might take me a long time before I'm going to see a return on that. So when I look at a business now, I I really like to look at where can I start with the easy wins, knock out as much low-hanging fruit right away, and then prioritize the bigger projects or the harder things I want to go after. Previously, um, when I, you know, I wouldn't have looked at that at all, when now I just think that's an essential thing. So when you buy a business, or especially your first business, is prioritize the easy stuff, not the hard stuff. Yeah, for sure. And so with that, like... Let's let's more strategy type stuff, right? Where people are, you know, looking at all right, what are the what's the low hanging fruit? What can I do to 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 get this happening and get more of an income? But let's talk about some of the different strategies that we could use. Like, what would that what would that be? I know a couple, but what do you think some of the low hanging fruits are normally when you do buy a first site, Charlie? And you, if you want to add a few in, and then I'll add a few in after you. All right, I'll give you some, I'll give you some um, easy ones. Like number one is site speed. It can be it might be as easy as just changing hosting provider. It could be a really simple thing. So site speed is a big one on my list because a faster site will convert better. And if you can raise the conversion rate on a site, quite often that'll be an awesome result. The second thing is mobile performance. So if a site isn't uh, performing as well on mobile, that's something I really prioritize because quite often that's an easy job to get fixed. In some cases it isn't, but in most it is in, in modern websites. So they're my first two. And then number three is if there's any form of remarketing that can be done. So this is more through ads. Like again, these are easier campaigns to set up if you've got the experience. I know that on a site, if I was to take a project where those three were applicable, that's not even, that all all could be done in a week with time to spare in my case. Um, So when I look at that, it's like, I know I'm going to get a lift in month one by just applying those three little things. 
What are some of your favourites, Jared? My absolute favourite is jumping on and seeing the email list and seeing what where they're sort of, you know, how, how much interaction there is with the email list and when they were last contacted and doing a promotion, like if it's a product thing or whatever it is, kind of doing a promotion to that list is really, really powerful because you can generate so much revenue that way. And not just to the email list, that's the first thing. The second place would I would go with it is on socials and adds, you know, a whole lot of, you know, content, great valuable content that leads into like a call to action for a promotion as well. And that's the, that's the kind of first go-to things that I would do. And another massive thing is that I would, depending on where the site's at, and it really changes from site to site, but I kind of look at the, you know, the theme. If the theme of the site is not really great and it's a quick and easy win to change a theme and a few things around that can be done within a day or two, obviously I've, you know, got a bit more experience in that it may take you a week or so to do something like that or you could hire somebody to do it for you is that making things look a lot sexier can be really, really cool for people who do come to the site because it, it kind of adds to the, it's kind of like a conversion, you know, conversion rate optimization tool to make things look sexier. Uh, and that's what I would probably lean towards. It depends on where, it's very dependent on the business. If there is marketing that's working in the business. Another little bonus thing that I would add is kind of like work out what's why it's working really, really well and put a little bit more ad spend into it and maybe even focus on not just marketing a bunch of products but just the best product and really pushing what much more traffic to just that. That's a really good point there. So I think I know it's not so much a what not to do but I think one of the things to do, so to speak, is to work out whatever marketing channel is working. So what's the marketing channel that's getting the best result? And I suppose doubling down on it or putting something into enhancing that to perform better. Yeah. And that's the the kind of overall thing that I think everybody should realize, Charlie, is that to not just work out like, all right, what do I need to do differently? Is that low-hanging fruit is like, all right, what's working really, really well and what marketing channel is is getting that to work really, really well and and going for it and using and, and not focusing on the weaknesses like everybody's already heard before, but focusing on the strengths of the business and really t- using that to your advantage. And that would, I would dare say, would categorize things from medium, like high, medium to low hanging fruits the way you've sort of uh, given us that analogy. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And so for me, I kind of, I like to tell people to have a certain time frame of what, like running the business before they actually like just jump in and start changing a whole thing, a whole lot of things. So as the title suggests, you know, what not to do. The main thing is to not just jump in and do everything and change everything straight away. I kind of like to tell people to have a certain time period where they can learn as much as they can from the seller learn how to run the business really, really well and get effective at that and also understand what's working well in the business before they go away and make the decisions. And that way they can make a pretty conscious and methodical and smart or wise decision on what to spend their time working on to grow it. Oh, now that's interesting. How long in general would you think is a good amount of time to not change things while you learn to run a certain type of business? This is, this is, that's great. And that's, it changes from business to business, but I would say roughly, you know, it depends on how much time you spend on it, right? It could be like if somebody spends a whole month of every day looking at the business, you could do it in, you know, a month and really learn it really well. I like to say anywhere from like a month to two months to really get the processes down, really see what's working. It also is dependent on if the business is a, uh, what a, what's, I've just lost the word, like a seasonal business. It's going to be changed a, a little bit, but for most businesses, I would say roughly around two months. That way you get a good gauge on, how things are running, how to speak the language 
of the actual you know target customer and your target audience and that way that can be you know moved into all the different type of marketing you're doing and everything else that you move forwards with in growing the business to really understand you know what the business is about why people are coming to the business and how you can project that brand out in a better way in because in every touch point that you have on your site oh you just nailed something else i think it's interesting I mean, this is something I'll, I'll look at from my opinion, all right? So one of the things I think I look back on and go, I really feel that I didn't spend enough time understanding my customer in some of my businesses. Like, I feel like it was a mistake to not understand their needs and wants and desires and why they buy or use uh, a product or service. Is that something you consciously do in the first month of having a, a, a site or business? <laughs> Great question. Well, for my first business, certainly not, right? I just assumed that everybody that had known a little bit about the industry that I was in or the niche that I was in was just like, you need to, you know, have my product or service. Uh, and I didn't know. I didn't even, I don't think I really knew, Charlie, what touch point, like not touch points, but speaking their language was. I didn't really know much about how to understand what their pain points are what they actually really really want and you know what problems my product and service was actually solving and not at a like a a larger scale but like down to the nitty-bitty things you know and crossing all those off the list and marketing in that way so now it definitely is like now it's definitely a part of like all right how do I not just know but kind of be that target market person totally. so um now it's definitely a thing and that's something that definitely what not to do is just have the assumption that you know who your target market is you know and for those of you who are looking at the google analytics before you buy the businesses is that you can already start to get a gauge on who your target market is but the best way to really do it i believe is is be on the phone with them and be emailing them and you know and seeing what's really important to them Absolutely. And I also think there's a, um, another one that I like to do just to add in on that is like those two are definitely great, but I found listening to podcasts in a niche can be an awesome thing. So personally, I'm in the baby and mum space and I'm clearly not a baby or a mum. Um, <laughs> so it's been a bit of a like unique thing where I suppose some of my thinking and thought patterns haven't necessarily been the best way to communicate in this market. But after listening to a lot of mum podcasts or baby podcasts, it's certainly, I suppose, awakened that side of me. I understand the perspective differently. Yeah, that's a really good way to go about it is that way you can, you don't have to be, you can do it in, a, you know, not have to be on the phone with people and all that sort of stuff. That's a really cool way. So for you, Charlie, when you sort of looked at the last couple of businesses that you were buying, what do you think, but you've got a lot of experience in owning and running online business and stuff like that, but say there was a novice that was going to come and buy these types of businesses that you've just, you know, been purchasing. What what do you think are some of the things that they would run in, like just run off or go away and do that may be destructive to the growth of the business? <laughs> Oh, that's a, that's a funny question, Jared. Um, I'm already laughing because I think I've seen people who have done these things before. <laughs> Probably me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I tell you what, I haven't seen you destroy any businesses, so you're out of um, whack there. But it's like I've certainly witnessed people buy businesses and just not understand them and just destroy them, like actually destroy them. Um, and I'll give you an example is I um, knew someone who had a site that was doing like 3 million hits per month. Um, and they basically just went in and stopped doing what was working in this business and just derailed it. Like, and did how, them. and how do they do that? Like, so we can learn like what, <laughs> what not to do. Like, well, it, it kind of comes back to the points you've already mentioned in this podcast is like, number one is like, didn't understand what's working in the business. So didn't really have a clear understanding of how the company worked, not just from a traffic perspective, but like from a financial perspective. So what makes this business money? And then it's like, okay, 
the behaviours that the previous owner was doing that led to that business making money, they just didn't do. So all of a sudden, this business went to a point where all the um, behaviours that were running this business, now there's a different set of behaviours. So without that understanding and doing different things, revenue started to dry up, traffic started to dry up. They just, yeah, really didn't tackle it from there. So point number one, understanding what's working in a business and then keep doing it or enhance it. The second thing that I think this person really didn't uh, understand is how much work was required in running this business. Yeah, I think they acquired it thinking, oh, this is going to be an easy side project. It's not going to need my full attention. And then blatantly disregarded um, that. And I think, you know, just in a caution of due diligence, I think people tend to lie on how many hours they spend on working their sites. <laughs> it's so it's done by almost every single uh, seller and it's, you know, they're trying to sell a business, right? And the that's a really good point that I tell people is to like, not just go, all right, this site's, you know, the guy's spending two, three hours a week on it. It's like, ask them what tasks they do per week and re- on the phone, realistically, how long does it take? And then I go back to where I was when I was first buying these, some of my first businesses and I ask myself, me being a rookie and not having training from them and maybe having a little bit of training from them after I buy the business, realistically, how long would it take me to do all of those tasks? And that way you can get a real fair gauge. And I think it's a great way to value the business uh, that way, you know, how long, how many hours does it roughly take? Because it's that's so important for people to know. And I'm so glad you brought that up. Well, I mean, this is an example is like, I'm, I would say I'm pretty good at AdWords. Like it's something I've spent a lot of time on. And um, from my side of things, it's like, you know, the first time I did an audit on an AdWords account, it took me a day to go through an account and understand it. And then by the, um, let's say a few years into doing it, I could do that in, you know, 20 minutes. So it's like, yeah. it's very interesting. Like, you know, someone might say, oh, the site takes me three hours a week to run. And it actually might. But the same tasks, because you don't have that level of experience, might take you a week. Exactly. And that's where people can come unstuck. It's like, oh, I don't have time to run the business because I still got my other job. And it's um, it's something that everybody should really, you know, take into consideration when they are buying a business. And to come back to your first point of how, you know, understand, you said one thing was to understand what actually makes the business money and focus on that thing that makes the business money and how can you streamline that and make it easier, cheaper and better to run the business just with how, where the money's coming in because people might be focusing on like where the money's not coming in and trying to push that, you know, uphill with, you know, any, without any strength behind them and it's not going to get anywhere because it's not supposed to. Yeah. I, th- I think our industry tends to be obsessed with traffic as well yeah. and not so much profit, which I know sounds really strange. Um, but the idea of like, I, I have friends that like, you know, will boast about the amount of traffic they get, not the amount of profit they make. And they definitely kind of, I suppose they treat them in correlation. They feel that, oh, the more traffic I get, the more money I'm going to make. But the reality is, is that if they had better keywords, better content, a higher converting site, they could probably make way more with half the traffic if it was focused enough. That's something that I picked up on as well, Charlie, when I first started getting the space is that in my blogs and stuff, I was like, I just need to get as much traffic to my website as possible and everything will be gravy. Now, it's not, yeah, for people are focusing more on the traffic rather than the profit, but I think the, the, the thing that links those together or allows you to get the profit is not just a whole lot of traffic, but highly targeted traffic and those people that are just like urging to buy your product. And if you spend your time really understanding, like I said earlier, understanding the language of the ta- the target audience and where your niche is and how to write really good copy and give them really good value. And then also on top of that, how to get that in front of them. You don't need millions and millions of page views per month, you know, coming through Google analytics and going, yeah, this is a great business because that's not really important. 
Yeah, quality counts for a lot. Hmm. Yeah. So what else what did you learn that, you know, you think some people could go away and, and probably stuff up when they're going to buy a business? All right. So this is another one I've unfortunately seen is they do nothing. So someone buys a company on the idea that it's fine as it is and it doesn't need anymore. Um, and there's a saying that has floated around is a, a business is either growing or dying and there's probably nowhere in the middle. And I, I found that to be true. I've never seen a business stay stagnant with no love. So yeah. I think the biggest mistake you can make overall and like the number one thing I would say not to do is nothing. Yeah. it's And this is a thing that uh, I was speaking to uh, a great mate of mine yesterday that is going to go away and buy a business and it's he, he really, I think he said, uh, you know, he wants a business that's, you know, not just like going to be around for a year or two or whatever. And sure, there's some like little fads and stuff like that, but it's it's not going to go anywhere if you put time and effort and energy into it and grow it, right? You can't just, it's even like any investment that you buy, you can't just buy a property and let it sit there and not have do any maintenance to it or look at how to make that property better. It's just going to break down and die like any investment. Absolutely. So that reality, and there's a cool thing that I see on, uh, I think it's Empire Flippers, uh, maybe some other sites, is they have different profiles for different types of investors. Um, you got like Newbie Norm, um, Portfolio Paul, Lifestyle Larry. And the Lifestyle Larry is, you know, who the, like they sort of rate these businesses in different ways for the different types of investors that would go well in buying something like this. And it's a pretty cool way to go about it. I, I definitely agree. But there's a Lifestyle Larry uh, profile in there. And it's where, you know, you can just buy a business and have a really cool lifestyle and not, and not have to do anything. And that's just a massive misconception, right? Like you, if you really want to do nothing, at least have some measures put in place where you can do nothing. Like if you're going to invest in property, have a property manager <laughs> and, you know, a, a building maintenance manager. If you're going to have an online business, have at least, you know, a, a VA that can do a few things to keep it updated and growing. And you don't have to do much and they can just check in with you. Like it's kind of like the Tim Ferriss um, method of the four hour work week is you really can only work four hour work weeks or you can, you know, do a 30 minute work week. But as long as you've got those things put in place, you can do that. And it's a it's just a crazy thing or a crazy thought that people think they can get away with absolutely doing nothing in life and, and make a great return. Couldn't agree more. Mm. Awesome, Charlie. Well, there's so much that we've picked up on in the, where this conversation has gone and what not to do and what to do. And I hope everybody got a whole lot of value. Again, thank you so much for jumping on, Charlie. Where can people go away and find out more about you? Look, if anyone wants to learn more about me, you can head over to charlievella.com. I'll make sure I give you a link, Jared. We'll put it in the description. So you awesome. can check out my projects there. Awesome. Again, greatly appreciate you jumping on, Charlie. And for everybody listening, I hope you got a lot of value. Please go away, like, share. And also, if you did like this episode, please be sure to go away and leave me some feedback on what you actually liked. And I look forward to speaking to you guys soon.